Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Usborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension. And today we are happy to share with you the presentation entitled Spotted Lanternfly, Everything You Need to Know in Half an Hour. This is going to be presented by EAB University's own Elizabeth Barnes. Elizabeth is the exotic forest pest educator in the, de in the Department of Entomology at Purdue University. She received her doctorate in ecology from the University of Denver, where she specialized in plant insect interactions and studied tent caterpillars and fall webworms. She also currently works on science communications and invasive species outreach at Purdue. We welcome your comments and questions today, so please feel free to type them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod. Elizabeth will be answering them right after this presentation. Tomorrow, you will be mailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out because it helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include our presenter's contact information and especially in the information that you, the, those of that you want CEUs, it also will have information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today. And Elizabeth, go ahead with your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second in the Everything You Need to Know in the Half an Hour series. Uh, we did Gypsy Moth yesterday, and today we are going to talk to you about Spotted Lanternfly. Um, these talks are kind of an experiment to um, try out shorter half an hour webinars um, through Emerald Ashbor University. If you like it, please do give us that feedback. And if you don't like it, please give us that feedback as well so that we can make these better for you in the future. Uh, this talk is recorded. We are uh, trying out this method as well um, uh, so that uh, multiple experts can provide input into the talks. Um, Initially, we were going to switch off between me and Carrie Tauscher, um, but Carrie won't be with us today um, in the recording, and so uh, it's going to be me all the way through, so I guess I could have just done it live. Um, but the I do want to note that the uh, plant section is all Carrie's slides. I've just modified them a little bit because the outline is easier for me to sort of uh, uh, go through, um, but she does deserve all the credit there and the tips and information for tree identification are all from Carrie. Um, and so without further ado, let's get into the spotted lanternfly talk. Uh, so to start out with, I'm going to give you kind of a quick summary of what spotted lanternfly are, and then we'll move into the main talk where we'll get into all the details of this insect. Spotted lanternfly are rapidly spreading throughout the United States. They are highly destructive and their eggs are really cryptic. So they are often very difficult to spot on the things that they lay them on and they will lay them on just about anything. Uh, management is possible, but uh, it is expensive and it is time consuming. It usually requires multiple applications of insecticide um, over the course of the summer. There is also some biocontrol that's very promising, but it's still in the development and research stage. Uh, and finally, if you see any spotted lanternfly, if you suspect you see spotted lanternfly and you live outside the areas where it's currently pre present, please do report it. Um, we need to know where these insects are as soon as they invade a new area so we can get in and try and get them contained if possible. For those of you who aren't familiar with spotted lanternfly, this is a very common sight with these insects. They will absolutely cover trees and vines and uh, can be present in these horribly high densities. But where did they come from? Why are we suddenly getting these huge high numbers of these insects? 
Uh, well, they are native to parts of Asia where they are actually pretty uncommon in their native range. Uh, they were accidentally imported on some stone that was brought over into Pennsylvania. They were first detected in 2014, and at that point, they were sort of um, not actually that many of them yet. They took them a while to actually start spreading, but once they did spread, they've been moving rapidly since then. This is a map uh, last updated at the beginning of April that shows the uh, currently infested counties in blue. Um, if you are like me and you are in Indiana or one of the other states in the Midwest, the closest outbreak for us is Ohio. You can see at the Pennsylvania Ohio border, there's some spotted lanternfly. However, um, I think it's also worth noting uh, that if you highlight the red dots, I've put little purple flags on them so they're easier to see. These are all the places where an individual spotted lanternfly was found, but they did not actually establish a population. For example, in the uh, Massachusetts uh, find, it was a dead spotted lanternfly in a container that was shipped around Christmas. Um, and I point this out to kind of show you how easy it is to not notice some eggs or some uh, adult lanternflies and something that's being shipped around. So this is how they are able to really hop those counties. Um, and, and this is how they're being spread. They're not being spread as much through their own movement. They're, they're not very fast in that sense. They are being spread through hitchhiking onto things. Here is a map showing the potential future distribution of spotted lanternfly. Um, I have the citation for this paper at the bottom of the screen. I recommend reading more into it. It's a really interesting paper. Um, the uh, sort of reddish orange colors are the areas of um, high high probability of potential future distribution of spotted lanternfly, then yellow is medium, green is low, and white is unsuitable. Uh, and unfortunately, if you're, again, like me in Indiana or some other places in the Midwest, Illinois is not faring much better, we are right in that uh, high suitability range. So unfortunately, the prediction is that spotted lanternfly will love it in Indiana once it gets here. As I mentioned before, spotted lanternfly is mainly spread through hitchhiking. Um, they uh, often will um, be found in sort of edge areas and then they will hop onto vehicles or things like trains as they're moving through an area. Uh, another issue is both live and cut plants uh, that are then transported to another area. And some of the ways that you can prevent this spread are um, by uh, when you're traveling through the area or if you're someone who's shipping out of an area, you are probably already familiar with all the rules about um, inspecting your vehicles, inspecting your plants before they leave the area. Um, but I would also say if you're someone who's receiving something from uh, in, in, in a spotted lanternfly infested area, that if you can, it might be worthwhile to inspect it when you receive it as well. Um, I, I know that this might be prohibitively time consuming for some people, but um, it's just that added layer of protection to hopefully reduce a chance that it spreads even further. So now we're going to get into some basic spotted lanternfly biology. Uh, spotted lanternflies overwinter as eggs. They hatch out in April and June, and their first instar and uh, second and third as well are these small little black and white insects. Uh, sometimes people confuse them with ticks, but you can kind of keep track um, because ticks will kind of uh, just crawl along the ground if you poke at them, where spotted lanternflies will hop. Um, then in their fourth instar, they get a little bit more brightly colored. They're a little bit more flashy. Uh, at this point, they get that red coloration in addition to the black and white. And then as the adults, this is the classic image of a spotted lantern fly that most of us are used to seeing. Um, it has those, um, those spotted wings and the hind wings with the white stripe and the bright red patches. Um, spotted lanternfly are sometimes, even in the adult stage, mixed up with some other uh, insects. But if you think you've seen a spotted lanternfly, please do report it. Don't hesitate to report it. We would rather get um, a report and find out that it's something like a moth or a cicada rather than risk someone um, second guessing themselves and not reporting a spotted lanternfly. So please do send in those reports. 
I do want to also highlight the egg stage of the spotted lanternfly. Um, here is a picture of actually two egg masses. And I'll give you a second to kind of look at the screen, see if you can figure out where it is. And it is, they are rather, here. Um, and, and you can see how well that blends into that tree trunk. They just, they look like mud. That's why uh, it's so easy for these things to spread because they, they honestly look like nothing at all. The insects, when they hatch out of their eggs, they will feed on phloem with this tube-like mouth part that they stick right into the trees. Um, and they eat a wide range of plants. So they eat grapes, uh, river birch, maple, black walnut, tree of heaven, roses, and over a hundred other species of plants. So these are true generalist insects. They will switch the host plants that they're focusing on throughout the growing season. This is important to note if you're someone who is monitoring for spotted lanternfly and doing surveys for that. Um, you may want to focus your efforts in on different trees at different times of the year, depending on what the spotted lanternfly would be preferring at that time of year. Um, and this chart is as taken from Penn State Extension, uh, which goes into a lot of details about this. So I recommend checking out their website if you are someone monitoring monitoring for a uh, spotted lanternfly. The, the kind of upside, some of you may have perked up when I said tree of heaven, is that yes, they do strongly prefer tree of heaven, which is also an invasive species that we don't want around. Um, it does have better survival on tree of heaven. Uh, tree of heaven and the black walnut are the only trees that researchers in a recent study found that spotted lanternfly would survive all the way through into adulthood on those trees. However, they did just as well if they were allowed to have the sort of mixed diet that they would have in the wild. Um, and so tree of heaven is also not needed for reproduction, which means even if we get rid of all the uh, tree of heaven, we're not going to stop spotted lanternfly, but since they are more successful with tree of heaven, it's, you know, it might help with spotted lanternfly a little. And even if it doesn't, you should, we should be getting rid of tree of heaven in any case. So now's the time to go out and do it. Now we're going to move on to talking about the impact of these insects on trees. Um, on, on and other plants, excuse me. Uh, so they, we are starting to see signs of stress on trees that have been repeatedly uh, hit by large numbers of spotted lanternfly. Um, there is some indication that they aren't able to store nutrients as well, and there may be reductions in uh, growth or trees might potentially even be killed by this, um, and it makes them more susceptible to other issues like drought. Uh, we've also started seeing this really kind of uh, just awful looking effect where there can be tree root wounds from spotted lanternfly that then get infected with um, bacteria and you get this almost like foamy fermented mass uh, on the trees, which um, again, it, we're, we're still in early stages of all of this research. Just to reiterate, it's only been here since 2014. So we're still figuring out what effect that might have on trees. The impact on crops is the worst on grapes, at least uh, what we have seen so far. It will kill grape vines very easily. Um, the vineyards out in Pennsylvania have been very badly impacted by um, um, the spread of spotted lanternfly. Um, even when they are able to protect their grapes, uh, they've had to drastically increase spraying, which is, of course, time-consuming for them and also um, very expensive. Uh, so, so that's been a big problem. Um, it's particularly bad at the edges of the vineyards, and um, the same is true in fields for other, other plants, where uh, you will sometimes see as many as 400 spotted lanternfly on a single vine. Uh, the impact on fruit trees is unclear at the moment. I have spoken with people who have said they have a big impact on fruit trees. I have spoken to people who said there is little to no impact on fruit trees. Um, so it seems like uh, this may be kind of regionally different or it just needs more investigation. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to clear that up and give better advice there. 
There are also a lot of indirect uh, impacts of spotted lanternfly from the honeydew that they produce, which is essentially spotted lanternfly pea. Um, it's full of sugar. It rains down onto the understory. It coats the plants there, um, and if it, your house is under it, it'll coat your deck or your car. And then it encourages the growth of sooty mold, which prevents the plants from photosynthesizing. So then you can see dieback in some of the plants in the understory. There's good news and bad news in terms of management. Um, there are a wide range of really effective chemical treatments from sprays, injections, uh, soil drenches. Um, there are some issues with this, though. Uh, one is that we get repeated invasions of spotted lanternflies. So if you, say, treat with a spray, well, in not too long, the spotted lanternfly, another wave of the adults is going to come back in and um, you'll, you'll be back to square one. Everything will be covered in spotted lanternfly all over again. Uh, another issue is that you can get this kind of buildup of dead, decaying spotted lanternflies at the base of your tree. And if this is in your yard or if you're someone who is, say, uh, responsible for city parks, that's unpleasant. People don't really want to be around it. Uh, so that's a nuisance as well. The uh, recommended management techniques vary depending on the time of year. I'm not going to get too much into this um, just for time's sake, but you can learn more about this again from Penn State website that Spotted Lanternfly Management for Landscape Professionals has an excellent breakdown of what you can use and when you should use it. There is some potential biocontrol. No, not with birds. Birds don't seem to actually eat them enough uh, for it to be an effective biocontrol, but it's a great picture. So, you know, good job the birds that are eating spotted lanternfly. There are two parasitoids that are being evaluated right now as potential biocontrol uh, for spotted lanternfly. They were collected in China uh, along with um, partners in China. Uh, right now, they're being evaluated for uh, how we can rear them in large numbers, where we can find more of them, and what their effects are on non target species, um, which it's, it's all being evaluated right now. So um, if you'd like more details on that, send me an email and I can direct you so, to some uh, really good resources to learn more about that process. Uh, there are also some pathogens that have a strong potential for um, being effective biocontrol for spotted lanternfly. Um, again, they're um, still studying this right now, but the early results are really promising. So that might be something that we can use to um, treat our plants and maybe protect them against spot, uh, spotted lanternfly in the future. Now we're going to move into the host plant ID uh, section of the talk. And again, as a reminder, um, Carrie Tauscher helped put all of this together. So the credit goes to her for that. Uh, spotted lanternfly, again, feed on a wide range of plants, but we are going to focus on some plants that are um, of economic importance and are um, major host plants for spotted lanternfly. Just a little bit of quick plant ID review for you. Uh, I will talk about alternate and opposite uh, leaves. What I mean by this is how the leaves are attached to the twigs or branches. If they are alternate, they are um, alternating along the branch. So they're not directly across from one another. Uh, you can think of this as if you stick one arm up in the air. So say your left arm and you stick your right leg out. Um, the place on your body that they attach is not directly opposite, so it's alternating along your body. Whereas if you stick both your arms straight up in the air, they are opposite to each other, um, and uh, that is the same thing for your legs further down. So if uh, you can think of it as symmetrical or asymmetrical as well. I will also be talking about simple versus compound leaves. Uh, simple leaves are those, that first leaf example there on the screen. Um, these are, they look like one solid individual leaf that's attaching to a twig versus compound leaves, which is made up of several leaflets. Um, and then those attach along a sort of a stem. It looks like a stem along the center. And then that attaches to the plant. 
for the simple leaf, it looks like, obviously it looks like only one leaf. For the compound leaf, it almost looks like there are five leaves there. But really, if you look at it closely, you can see that the leaf is attaching to the branch at the bottom, so the green to the brown, and so that whole thing is an individual leaf. The first plant that we're going to talk about is the apple, um, and this includes apples, crab apples, anything closely related to an apple. Uh, they have simple alternate leaves that are typically two to four inches long, although there can be a, a decent amount of variation. Uh, the leaves are kind of broadly oval shaped, although you can see they've got a bit of a tip at either end, and they have serrated edges. Um, if you look, particularly that picture in the center, this one right here, it's got these little pointy uh, uh, teeth at the edge. Uh, the flowers have five petals, um, although as I said yesterday, uh, if there's a strong breeze, sometimes I'll end up with a few less than that, but typically an intact flower has five petals. Uh, another good way to recognize them is, of course, the fruit, um, and I'm sure a lot of you would recognize, um, if, well, most of you probably would recognize uh, an apple like you would have as a snack, um, but uh, crab apples can also be a good way to recognize these types of plants. Cherries are another species that a spotted lanternfly will feed on. They have alternate leaves. Um, and again, the spotted lanternfly are attacking both the ornamental cherries, the cultivated cherries for the fruit, um, as well as wild cherries and plums are also attacked by spotted lanternfly. Uh, these, as I said earlier, these guys are very true extreme generalists. Uh, wild cherries have small flowers um, that are sort of in a, a large group together growing off of the plant. They are very sweet smelling. Uh, I, I I love the smell of cherries. They have a, a really nice scent when you're hiking along a trail. Um, the fruits are uh, also a good way to recognize them. Now, some cherries have distinctive bark. In particular, the black cherries have this kind of burnt potato chip bark to them. The twigs are heavily lenticelled, which are these little white spots along the twig. That's an excellent way to recognize a cherry tree as well. Uh, grapes are also a favorite of spotted lanternfly, both the grapes in a vineyard and the native wild grapes. Grapes have thick vines with flaky bark and wide leaves with sort of finger-like veins. Uh, here you can get a kind of a sense of that. If you look at these, they've got these um, major veins coming out from the bottom, almost if you like spread your hand out and the, the, the fingers radiate out in the same way that these veins radiate out. And then they've got smaller veins coming off to the side as well. Um, another way not to you know, go on a uh, uh, hiking experience in the woods again, but the smell of the grapes is a good way to know if there are some nearby. If you are in the woods and you, you smell that distinctive, rich grape smell, um, I always start looking around trying to figure out where the wild grapes are. Sometimes I can't even see them, but I know they're there because that odor is so strong and so distinctive. Um, so if you are someone who is surveying for spotted lanternfly to try and um, do, detect them early in new areas, uh, the grapes might be a good place to look and you can use that smell to find those wild grapes. So again, just remember to check the wild grapes, the wild cherries, uh, crab apples, um, as well as the cultivated varieties because spotted lanternfly aren't picky when it comes to wild versus cultivated, um, in these cases at least. They will also feed on black walnut. These uh, trees have alternate leaves with large compound leaves. So these are our first compound leaves in the uh, ID list. Uh, this whole thing is a single leaf. This whole thing is a single leaf and it has lots and lots of individual leaflets. This is one good way to tell a walnut from other types of trees that have compound leaves like ashes. Uh, just the sheer number of leaflets that they have is quite impressive actually. Uh, another good way to recognize them is that the leaflets will vary in size and they have these 
two leaflets going off to the sides at the tips, whereas uh, many other plants will have a single leaf, uh, or rather leaflet at the end of the um, at the end of the the uh, stem. Um, they have two small leaflets going off to the side instead. The bark of the black walnut has deep fissures in it. And if you gently scrape off some bark, it has this wonderful um, rich chocolate brown color. Um, just, you know, just to know, we don't usually encourage people to scrape bark on trees, but with walnuts, it's a very good ID trait. So it's just scrape a very small amount if you do that. An even better way to ID a walnut is if you can get your hands on a twig, cut it in half and look for these, um, these chambered pits. They look kind of like a mushroom cap. Black walnut buds have fuzzy little white hairs on them. Um, and they have these large fruits that are covered in a husk that have a distinctive citrusy smell. Uh, next time you get a chance, smell a, a, a walnut a, that still has a husk on it and you will really, uh, it'll be burned into your memory. It's, it's a very pungent odor. Uh, they, the um, leaf scars have this, it almost looks like a little face um, where the, the vascular bundle is. Um, there's this little smile, some eyes, some ears. Um, I think it looks like a teddy bear. Carrie thinks it looks like E.T., whatever works for you as a, a way to remember it. Um, just go with that. Um, but it, it does have this kind of happy look to it in this heart-shaped face. Spotted lanternfly will also feed on poplar. Um, these are the plants that are usually responsible for that white fuzz that you see in the air. Um, that's their seeds being dispersed. Uh, the petiole on poplars is flat. So if you can find a leaf, pick it up and try and roll it between your fingers and you'll have a hard time rolling it and it'll move in kind of a jerky motion. Um, that is very distinctive to poplar. River birch are a particular favorite of spotted lanternfly. Uh, you can ID river birch by looking at their leaves, which um, most of them have a similar sort of wedge shape to them uh, with teeth at the edges. Some birches also have peeling bark, although not all of them have peeling bark and birches are not the only trees with peeling bark. Uh, the leaves, uh, uh, the twigs rather are heavily lenticelled, which are these, uh, these little, again, white spots on them. And the twigs are kind of a dark purple gray color. They also will have catkins in the early spring, which is a good way to notice and ID your uh, birch trees. Maples may be the easiest ident to identify plants that we have on our list today. Uh, they have opposite branching and their seeds are these schizocarps. They've got little wings on them uh, on the edge of the seeds to make that classic helicopter shape. Um, and the shape of the leaf itself is, well, it looks like the Canadian flag. If you live in North America, uh, you probably recognize it from the Canadian flag. Um, and that stays true of all sorts of different species of birches. You can see we've got a wide variety of leaf shapes here. And even though there are uh, variations in them, clear variations, uh, they still have that Canadian flag shape to them. I will go over a few identifying characteristics on specific um, maples, but I'm not going to go over every single one and every single ID trait because we just don't have time. Um, sugar uh, maples have these uh, full seeds to them. They um, are round perfectly, uh, not perfectly, but they are very round and they look like they're sort of full and almost swollen. Uh, the wing on the uh, seed is also fairly short. It's about one to two inches. Uh, red maples tend to have a kind of red blush to them and the seeds have a football shape. Silver maple leaves are deeply lobed and they are white on the underside. Lilacs are also attacked by spotted lanternfly, both the garden and the tree variety. They have opposite branching and spade-shaped leaves with a kind of waxy texture to them. Um, not heavily, heavily waxy, but if you rub them between your fingers, they sort of feel like wax paper almost. The flowers are cone-shaped and very, very fragrant. Um, 
And lastly, we have Tree of Heaven, uh, probably most people's least favorite tree on this list. Uh, the leaves do look kind of like walnut leaves, but the big difference is that they have these teeth, one to two teeth at the base of the leaflet. So look for that when you're trying to distinguish between walnuts and tree of heaven. They are also glossier than uh, walnut or sumac. The bark is a flat gray with this kind of zigzag pattern going down it. Um, some people say it looks like lightning. I think it almost looks a little bit like stretch marks. Um, and again, if you're able to get a twig and you can cut it in half, the pith is very distinctive. It is caramel colored. Uh, some people call it peanut butter pith, um, but either way, uh, it's that smooth kind of golden color to it. The twigs are very stout and they have a shield shaped leaf scar on them. Um, there is a decent amount of variation in the leaf scars though, so that might not be a characteristic you want to rely on. It also smells, uh, and some people, please do note, are sensitive to that smell. Um, so take precautions uh, when you are trying to deal with your tree of heaven. This is one invasive species where you absolutely want to make sure that you look into uh, recommendations for how you're managing it before you go ahead and start that work. These seeds tend to come out in midsummer and they kind of look like these like big fluffy pom poms up in the tree. And they can be anything from like a lime green to a coral pink. So what can you do? Well, first off, if you see a spotted lanternfly, please report it. Um, we have a range of ways to do that. Edmaps um, or Great Lakes will both allow you to submit photos, locations, and other uh, details, which will then be reviewed by experts. You can also call 1-866-663-9684 uh, to report invasive species. And we have a website through Purdue, report invasive. Com. Or, failing all of that, please email us. Email anybody who works on invasive species and they will connect you to the right person. We all talk to each other. Uh, when you do report an invasive species, uh, please write down where you are or if you're taking a photo with the smartphone, a lot of times that'll record location data inside of it. Um, take a picture. This picture is incredibly valuable to us. Um, we want to know where it is and what it looks like to verify that what you saw actually was a spotted lanternfly. Um, and if you can collect a sample, a good way to do this is if you have a water bottle or any other container, just kind of put it over the top and just scoop it right up. Um, again, if you think you've seen a spotted lanternfly, please report it. Uh, we would rather get uh, reports of things that aren't spotted lanternflies than miss a report of an actual spotted lanternfly in a new area. So to finish up, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those now. Our contact information is on the screen as well as that website where you can find more invasive species information and our social media. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, Richard asks, do other types of insects have similar looking egg cases? Um, there are a few, but I would say that the spotted lanternfly eggs are, they're reasonably distinctive. Um, the only things that I can think of are there are some moths that have sort of similar egg casings. Um, old gypsy moth eggs can sometimes look like spotted lanternfly eggs, although they're also an invasive species. So, whoops. Oh, well, I guess it doesn't want me to share my screen. Um, <laughs> Um, if anyone needs my email address or any of our email addresses, uh, that will be in the email that follows. So that was just the point of sharing the screen again. Um, anyway, um, it, it can look like old gypsy moth eggs that have lost that sort of fuzz on it. Um, there are some moths. Um, there are some other plant hoppers that have similar egg masses, but they're much, much smaller. Um, I, I, honestly, I would say that 
you're less likely to get spotted lanternfly eggs confused with another insect's eggs, um, and you're more likely to get them confused with just, as I said before, like, like mud or something like uh, caked mud or clay. Okay, um, Jeffrey asks, oh, I'm sorry, wrong. Angel asks, can you elaborate a bit more why spotted lanternfly is uncommon within its native range? Sure. Um, so it's, I mean, it, it, it's part of, so basically in its native range, it's adapted to um, the conditions there and the plants are adapted to spotted lanternflies. So some of the plants there have defenses against it. And there are also um, predators and parasitoids that are specialized on spotted lanternfly that keep their numbers in check. Um, there's actually uh, some anecdotal evidence that in China where um, there are spotted lanternfly, um, if you spray a broad insecticide in an area, um, that then you end up seeing these spikes in spotted lanternfly numbers as they move back into the area. And the thought there is that that's because the parasitoids that kill the spotted lanternfly have been killed off. And um, so then that allows this kind of release in the population of spotted lanternflies so that they can really expand in numbers, which is good news for us because if we're able to, um, hopefully some of those parasitoids are the ones that we're testing right now. And if we're able to confirm that they're not going to attack any uh, North American insects, then we could potentially use those as biocontrol um, and release those to not eradicate spotted lanternfly, but get their populations down to a more manageable level. So um, at this point, it's very unlikely we're going to completely eradicate them. It's much more likely that will be able to find a way to kind of keep them in balance. That's that's the major goal. Um, could you tell us how many how many generations of spotted lanternfly are there in a year? There's one generation of spotted lanternfly that we've seen at the moment. There's a little bit of worry that as they move down into the south and there's that longer growing season that we might start to see two generations, but that hasn't happened yet. So far, it's really only one generation. Um, the nymphs grow throughout the summer, and then in the late summer, we see those adults. Um, unfortunately, they are destructive <laughs> at all of their stages in life, um, so it's not like we get a break in early summer. There's still spotted lanternfly damage then. All right. Um, the rest of these are comments. Jeffrey says that crushed walnut leaves have the same smell as their fruit. Uh, Mary, Mary says you'll step on the nutshells under the walnut tree, one of the fastest ID traits, especially if you're barefoot. Uh -huh. And one of the maples, the box elder, does not have Canadian flag shaped leaves, but does have a half a helicopter shape with seeds. Yeah, so um, I, I didn't get into the box elder. The, um, the box elder, they do... Their leaves, if you like lie them flat down, they do still have a bit of a Canadian flag shape, although it's not as distinctive. Um, so the, the commenter, um, I've forgotten who it was, I'm sorry, but the commenter is, is absolutely right that looking for those seeds is the more distinctive trait there. Okay, um, Mary asks, are researchers exploring host resistance in native habitat so we can breed it into say grapes? I don't know of anybody who is doing that work yet. Um, it's certainly a topic of interest. Um, I didn't get into this in too much detail. I kind of briefly mentioned it, but they were introduced in, uh, or we first noticed them rather in 2014, but then there was this long period where they were at low enough levels that we thought maybe we had actually escaped the problem. Maybe they would be here, but they wouldn't actually be an issue. And then their populations just absolutely exploded a couple of years ago. So it sounds like, okay, 2014, we've had a decent amount of time to be studying them, but no, it's really only the past few years that we've been dealing with this huge issue with these high population numbers. Um, so there's a lot of research that we're trying to get done as fast as we can. Um, and from what I've heard, more of the work so far has been about 
um, looking at pesticide applications. And I think I forgot to mention this um, when I was talking about the grapes and the damage, um, but actually even with the pesticide sprays, they're seeing a lot of damage on grapes. So it does protect them somewhat, but there's that additional weakening of the grapevines and mortality, even when you are spraying pesticides. Um, but that is, uh, just to circle back to the question, um, that is something that in the future will certainly be something that people will be looking into. All right, um, Lori asks, what damage to the trees will be evident earliest? Um, I would say it's less the damage to the trees that will be obvious and more the sooty mold under the trees that will be your first sign um, that there's there's an issue with a spotted lanternfly because that happens as soon as um, the spotted lantern flyer in an area. Um, now, of course, the exception to that is something like a grapevine where it is just outright immediately killing them. Um, you can you can think of spotted lantern fly. It's less like something like emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, where it's physically destroying the tree and physically carving out parts of the tree and killing it that way. And it's more that it's weakening the tree over time and it's causing problems for, for most sort of large, well-established trees um, as they um, as they lose these resources as the spotted lanternfly are feeding on them, which then makes them susceptible to um, other problems like um, um, pathogens in the future, or if there's a sudden drought and they're already weak, that's when you could see an issue with the tree. Um, it's similar to, we talked about this yesterday with gypsy moth, it's a similar idea. Okay, that, let's see here. Um, Annie asks, was there an ETA when it may be, may make, okay, I'm screwing this up. Okay. Was there an ETA when it may make its way into Indiana? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> oh, I hope it never gets here. Um, it's hard to predict the timing because they're not, it's not that they're spreading on their own. Um, if they were spreading on their own, we would be able to say, okay, so it spreads X number of miles a year. Therefore, it should be in Indiana in X number of years. It is spreading because it's hitchhiking. So we could get a report of it tomorrow, or we could get a report of it in five years. We don't really know at this point, and there's not a good way to predict it. Um, I am not encouraged by what I've seen in terms of the spread. That's why, even though it's not here in Indiana yet, we're talking about it so much because we do want people to know what it looks like so they'll report it and kind of in the back of their mind have information about, um, you know, when it gets here, what will I need to do to protect my, my plants? All right. Um, Richard asks if we report via the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app or www.eddmaps.org, do you get the data as well? And Cliff has answered that question. Cliff Sadoff has answered that question. Yes, you will. Yep. Um, so we have that one answered. All right, um, I am not seeing any more questions at this point, but folks, you will be getting an email from me tomorrow that will have contact information for Elizabeth and um, Cliff and Carrie. So, and also please uh, fill out the short survey. Um, and for those wanting CEUs, filling out that survey is going to be your ticket into getting credit for the, the um, watching the webinar. All right, I have one more question. Jeffrey says the map you had regarding their potential range, did that include climate change projections? Oh, that's an interesting question. No, no, it does not. Um, as, as far as I know, it's been it's been a little while since I've read the paper, but I'm almost I'm almost positive it was based on current conditions, not projected future conditions. So Oh, that is interesting. There might be differences in um, where we could see spotted lantern fly in the future. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I bet there will be differences in the potential distribution of spotted lantern fly in the future as with many other insects. So that's a great question. It's a good point too. 
I see an updated version of spotted lanternfly information coming <laughs> in the next few couple of three years. Yeah. All right, folks. Um, thank you again so much for coming. And Elizabeth, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, next Wednesday, we're going to have our half hour uh, session on Emerald Ash Borer. So um, check that out. Register for that. And maybe we will see you then next week. Thanks again, everybody.